Ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. My name is Matthew Astle and I am the CEO of Cavendish Group, the European media company who owns RAID, RAID standing for Regulation of AI, Internet and Data. Instead of highlighting differences between regions, there is a need to rebalance and to promote constructive cooperation where we can, of which regulating technology is one example. Technology transcends borders and some regulatory mechanisms must be able to do the same and our differences are much smaller than the common ground that unites us and the shared challenges that we face. Our RAID conference today is especially timely as the European Parliament only last week reached a provisional agreement on the AI Act which I'm quite sure will be touched upon today by our esteemed and very welcome speakers. The timing is critical as we can all quite rightly recognise that generative AI is rapidly entering into global mainstream usage. You're all extremely welcome today to our RAID conference and I must say that on behalf of Cavendish Group we are especially proud of quite how good the speakers are. It's a world-class event at which technology policymakers and regulators can meet. I'm grateful and I thank former Prime Minister Jean-Pierre Raffarin for his long-standing support and for all the work of our partner, the Fondation Prospective et Innovation. With the help of the Fondation, we launched RAID as a physical conference in the Pompidou Centre in Paris back in 2017. And during the enforced pandemic period of digital only events, we've evolved RAID and focused more squarely on becoming an international platform and a bridge for policymakers and for those who inform and input into the process of technology, legislation and regulation. I'm delighted to announce that RAID will be coming back to life as a physical conference at the Stanhope Hotel in Brussels on September the 26th of this year. We plan a high level gathering and we encourage you to book your places early as we'll have a limited number of spaces at what we hope will be a very high quality occasion rather like today. We encourage you to all try and use RAID as just one reason for a trip to Brussels around this time and we hope that you will be able to use our platform for more collaboration, more cooperation and more exchange with your international counterparts and colleagues. I've been a frequent visitor to China and to India over the last 20 years and I was back in Beijing a few weeks ago. Rather than focusing on differences, I choose instead to focus on common ground. Many of the conversations and discussions, be that around data security underpinning consumer confidence, adapting to generative AI, or balancing innovation with technology regulation. These topics were frankly no different to the discussions that might be heard today around Europe, in India, in Brazil, South Africa, Australia, South Korea, or the US. This fits with the essence of RAID to try and build a collaborative platform for international regulators. Please can I thank each and every one of our speakers. We are honored shortly to kick off the day with the dress, with addresses from Commissioner Didier Reynas, Minister Jean-Noël Barron and Madame Gabriela Ramos of UNESCO. I'm also about to hand over to Ben Awerson, our excellent event director who will take things from here. Please allow me to thank our sponsors Deloitte, Meta and Workday uh, who we work with very well and we commend them for their thoughtful input into today's agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all a very interesting, a very engaging and a topical day ahead. Please be frank, please be open and please all come to Brussels for September the 26th at the Stanhope Hotel as we bring RAID back as a physical event at which international technology regulators meet and exchange. Thank you, Matthew, and a very good morning afternoon or evening to you all wherever you are and welcome to the sixth RAID conference. Thank you all for joining us in record numbers. It's our great honour to host 45 distinguished speakers from government regulatory agencies and corporates from Europe, Asia, the Americas and Africa. The theme of this year's conference is bridging parallel lines. All regions in the world are facing common challenges and are developing legislation 
independently. But we need multilateral approaches now more than ever as digital technologies become more prevalent. So we've got an exciting array of topics ahead. We'll be talking about tackling global challenges together, AI and real applications, navigating trust and risk, competition and innovation, digital currency, personalization and fairness, privacy, security and borders. We are providing two-way French to English translation, which you can select in the sidebar. When listening to the interpretation, you will need to turn the sound off on the main streaming window. Please do ask questions of the speakers and share your thoughts on the event chat and on social media using the hashtag RAID 2023. We are particularly grateful to our platinum sponsor Deloitte and gold sponsor Meta and our new silver sponsor Workday for their support and expertise. We're also really looking forward to bringing you together face to face at RAID Physical on the 26th of September at the luxurious Stanhope Hotel in the European quarter of Brussels. So please do join us there. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome to the RAID stage our opening keynote speakers, Commissioner Didier Reinders, Justice Commissioner of the European Commission, Jean-Noël Barrault, Minister of Digital Transition and Telecommunications of France, and Gabriela Ramos, Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences at UNESCO. Commissioner Reinders, thank you so much for joining us again and welcome. A very warm welcome to everyone. I'm delighted that the organizers have invited me back to address the RAID platform. Last year's conference was about creating balance in a precarious world. Sometimes we need more than balance to face our common global challenges. Sometimes we need to build bridges to reach common ground through regulatory alignment of all digital policies. At the European Commission, we are looking at developing data bridges, for example. The GDPR allows us to work on facilitating data flows by ensuring that adequate protection travels with the data. More and more countries around the world are following this approach. Japan's Data Free Flow with Trust initiative is a good example. I'm not saying that building data bridges is easy, especially when it concerns access to data by law enforcement authorities or intelligence agencies. But I remain optimistic. When like-minded partners join forces, we can find solutions to benefit both citizens and the economy. Two developments are certainly encouraging. At bilateral level, we are making ground on a new AU-US data privacy framework. And at multilateral level, the AU's adoption with the OECD of a set of common principles on government access to data. Already, the European Union and Japan have created the world's largest area of free and safe data flows through a mutual adequacy finding. We are now exploring similar arrangements with other partners, like Brazil. An arrangement with one country also has a network effect, resulting in the free flow of data with other jurisdictions around the world that recognize our adequacy decisions under their own transfer rules. Besides adequacy decisions, Cooperating with regional organizations and networks, such as the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or the Ibero-American Data Protection Networks, is increasingly important. With these organizations, we are working on model contractual clauses, as this is a transfer mechanism that we all have in common. We are building bridges. The next step is to ensure effective enforcement through a legal initiative to facilitate cross-border cooperation between data protection authorities. In the digital economy, our common interests go far beyond data flows, of course, from artificial intelligence to consumers' digital services 
and digital currencies, for example. The topic of digital currencies is interesting and we are vigilant from justice policy and consumer protection perspectives. An initiative is planned for adoption by the College of Commissioners this coming summer. On AI, the European Union strongly favours innovation, but to encourage uptake, we should reduce the risk to safety and protect fundamental rights. ChatGPT and the potential consequences for consumer privacy and protection is a prime example of the threat AI poses. The coordinated European approach on AI together with the AI Act therefore takes a two-part approach focusing on excellence and trust in the technology. The proposal for the AI Liability Directive adopted last year is also part of this approach. When AI systems cause harm, victims should be able to claim compensation. Equally, businesses need legal certainty about their liability risks. I believe that Europe can set the global standard for trustworthy AI and lay the groundwork for cooperating on AI with like-minded countries which align their approach with EU rules and values. It also makes sense to avoid a regulatory race to the bottom and create a level playing field for developing and using AI. In today's digital world, it's true that consumers face many challenges. As I have said many times, trust is key to a functioning digital economy. Consumers must then have the same level of protection online as they do offline. The European Union now has much stronger rules to protect consumers in the digital era, especially with the Digital Services and Digital Markets Act. The Commission is working to ensure these strong rules will be fully upheld once applicable from early 2024. Also in 2022, new requirements entered into application. I'm thinking of the Digital Content Directive, the Revised Sale of Goods Directive, which includes goods with digital elements, and the Better Enforcement and Modernization of Consumer Law Directive to bring consumer protection up to speed with the digital sphere. Consumers now benefit from more transparency when they are reading online reviews, searching for products or buying from online marketplaces. And they have clear rights to remedies, for example, terminating a contract when digital content and digital services do not conform. We are also close to the formal adoption of the new General Product Safety Regulation, which will strengthen product safety rules for online marketplaces operating in the European single market. We have also made good progress on the revision of EU rules on consumer credit and distance marketing of financial services. And thanks to our work on enforcement with the CPC network, WhatsApp, TikTok, Wish, Amazon Prime, to name just a few, have committed to improve the information to consumers in compliance with EU consumer law. But as public enforcers, we must be able to respond faster, more effectively and with more deterrent means to practices that threaten the consumer's collective interests. Consumers and traders should also have more efficient tools to solve potential disputes in digital markets. This is why we will soon propose a new consumer enforcement package. We are also aware that the EU may need to do more to ensure digital fairness. Indeed, 
42% of stakeholders that responded to our public consultation last year think that there are legal gaps or uncertainties in the current framework. And earlier this year, the sweep by CPC authorities show that nearly 40% of online shopping websites rely on dark patterns to trick consumers. We are therefore investigating how to ensure that EU consumer law keeps up with market developments. If necessary, we will propose improvements. But with a fast changing digital environment, we should not just look to making rules. Associating the industry can also provide a solution. Last month, at the Consumer Summit, I propose to launch a new voluntary business pledge to empower consumers to effectively choose advertising models that correspond to their privacy choices and simplify their management of cookies. I'm happy that many trade associations and tech companies were positive and will participate at a roundtable on this topic. I know you have a busy agenda and many interesting things to discuss in your panels. So I will stop here and let you get on with this fascinating conference. I wish you fruitful discussions. Thank you very much. Cher commissaire, cher Didier, cher membre de gouvernement, chers éminentes et éminents panélistes et participants, mesdames et messieurs, tout d'abord, permettez-moi de remercier chaleureusement Jean-Pierre Raffarin pour son invitation à intervenir à la conférence, qui est une occasion exceptionnelle de rassembler des représentants des différentes parties prenantes de notre société numérique pour travailler ensemble sur des défis mondiaux. Je suis désolé de ne pas être parmi vous aujourd'hui, car le thème de cette conférence, « Multiplication des zones réglementaires, comment trouver des points de convergence », revêt une importance cruciale dans un monde où la numérisation accélérée de l'économie soulève des questions de plus en plus complexes en matière de réglementation et de modèles de valeur. Les gouvernements ne peuvent plus simplement suivre leur propre voie. Il est impératif qu'ils collaborent pour trouver des solutions communes à ces défis communs. Fonctionnement de l'Internet mondial, cyberguerre et cyberdiplomatie, régulation des plateformes systémiques et des hyperscalers, sécurité des chaînes d'approvisionnement sont autant de mots-clés qui incarnent le besoin d'une gouvernance et d'une pensée globale du numérique. Il est crucial de comprendre que les technologies numériques et les télécommunications sont désormais au cœur de toutes les économies modernes et sont devenues un moteur essentiel de croissance, d'innovation et de création d'emplois dans le monde entier. Elles sont également cruciales pour relever les défis mondiaux tels que le changement climatique, la santé publique, mais encore la progression de l'éducation et de l'accès à l'information à l'échelle mondiale. La numérisation accélérée de l'économie présente des défis et des opportunités considérables pour les gouvernements qui doivent néanmoins être en mesure de répondre aux préoccupations éthiques, sociales et économiques des citoyens, notamment en matière de protection de la vie privée, de sécurité et de responsabilité des outils numériques. Un des exemples les plus évocateurs de ces défis communs est la réglementation de l'intelligence artificielle. Cette réglementation au niveau européen, nous la souhaitons éthique, responsable et centré sur l'homme. À cette seule condition, ces technologies seront porteuses d'opportunités économiques et de progrès. Je suis d'ailleurs ravi que ce sujet soit abordé aujourd'hui par un panel de qualité et soulevant des interrogations dont les réponses sont primordiales pour le futur de la réglementation de l'intelligence artificielle. Il nous faut en effet répondre aux inquiétudes, notamment concernant le manque de transparence de ces systèmes, la protection des données personnelles ou encore l'impact de ces technologies sur le futur du travail et de nos structures productives. À cet égard, depuis 2021, de nombreuses initiatives ont été lancées par divers acteurs à travers le monde pour élaborer des lignes directrices, des règles ou des normes qui encadrent l'utilisation de l'intelligence artificielle de manière responsable, en évitant les préjudices et la discrimination des personnes. La France a joué et joue encore un rôle de premier plan en Europe en matière de réglementation de l'intelligence artificielle, notamment durant la présidence française du Conseil de l'Union européenne, où nous avons travaillé à rendre le futur règlement sur l'intelligence artificielle à la fois flexible et protecteur de nos droits et valeurs. Aujourd'hui, ces modèles d'encadrement doivent trouver une résonance à l'échelle internationale et c'est notamment l'une des positions que j'ai défendues il y a quelques jours au G7 numérique au Japon 
en demandant à ce que l'OCDE puisse se saisir de certaines grandes réflexions prospectives en matière de régulation de l'intelligence artificielle. Nous parlons beaucoup de ce sujet, mais de même, le métavers est une nouvelle frontière numérique qui offre des possibilités inédites pour les interactions sociales et les expériences virtuelles. Toutefois, il est crucial que nous nous assurions que le métavers soit inclusif et accessible à tous, et qu'il ne renforce pas les inégalités, qu'il respecte les droits de chacun. Nous devons veiller à ce que les citoyens aient un contrôle total sur leur vie numérique, y compris dans le métavers. Nous pouvons aussi faire mieux sur le volet réglementaire afin de trouver le bon équilibre entre la protection de nos concitoyens et de nos entreprises et l'encouragement à l'innovation et à sa diffusion. C'est tout l'objet des règlements sur les marchés numériques, le DM1, et sur les services numériques, le DSA, qui impose aux grands acteurs du marché le respect de règles claires, précises et proportionnées selon leur taille. Le DMA a pour objectif de favoriser une concurrence plus équitable sur les marchés numériques en empêchant certains géants de limiter les choix des entreprises et des consommateurs qui utilisent leurs services, d'imposer des relations contractuelles déséquilibrées ou encore de priver leurs concurrents d'un accès essentiel au marché. Quant au DSA, les plateformes numériques seront tenues responsables de leurs actions. Elles devront mettre en place des mesures de modération efficaces, être plus transparentes sur leurs choix de publicité en ligne et les plus grandes devront par ailleurs prendre des mesures pour atténuer les risques systémiques engendrés par leurs services. Ces législations européennes constitueront demain, tout comme le RGPD le fait aujourd'hui, des références majeures pour la gouvernance de nos acteurs numériques. Et je souhaite que d'autres pays puissent s'inspirer de ce type de réglementation. Enfin, en tant que pays hôte d'un secteur des télécommunications et de la cybersécurité florissante, nous sommes conscients des considérations géostratégiques qui façonnent l'avenir de ces industries. La sécurité et la confiance dans les réseaux deviennent une condition sine qua non à leur diffusion. Nous devons veiller à ce que l'industrie des télécommunications reste innovante, concurrentielle et capable de fournir des services de qualité à tous les citoyens. Nous devons également travailler à trouver des solutions communes pour les défis mondiaux, tels que l'expansion de la couverture Internet et la promotion de la connectivité mondiale. En matière de cybersécurité, l'action et l'engagement diplomatique de la France ont été de renforcer son encadrement par le droit, tout en augmentant le niveau de résilience et de sécurité globale. Au niveau international, les travaux des Nations Unies ont déjà permis de poser les bases de normes internationales en affirmant notamment que le droit international, y compris la Charte des Nations Unies, s'applique pleinement dans le cyberespace. Pour terminer, je voudrais donc insister sur l'importance de faire de la gouvernance numérique une priorité politique. Nous ne pouvons pas laisser la régulation de l'espace numérique aux seules entreprises ou à la seule technologie. Nous devons travailler ensemble à tous les échelons de la gouvernance pour élaborer des politiques qui protègent les droits des citoyens, favorisent l'innovation et assurent la sécurité. Nous avons besoin d'une gouvernance numérique qui soit responsable et inclusive, qui protège nos valeurs fondamentales et qui nous permette de réaliser tout le potentiel de la révolution numérique. Parfois, les points de convergence se construisent aussi sur les domaines où nous sommes tous d'accord. Je pense par exemple à la protection des mineurs, qui sert bien souvent d'aiguillon pour construire des consensus plus larges. J'appelle évidemment les parties prenantes à s'inspirer des grandes victoires qui ont été les nôtres ces dernières années, comme notamment le RGPD, le DSA, et le DMA, mais également à nourrir nos réflexions de leur réussite et de leurs meilleures pratiques afin de multiplier ces consensus. Je vous remercie et vous souhaite une excellente journée de discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to have this opportunity to deliver this keynote speech for you today. The Red Conference provides a fantastic venue for holding a vital dialogue about the future of tech, tech regulation, and I would like to commend the organizers for this excellent event. The governance of artificial intelligence is both a global challenge and urgently needed as algorithmic systems have become an integral and growing part of our daily lives. Even those at the helm of the most groundbreaking discoveries in AI are well aware that they cannot continue to forge ahead without a rule book. On 22nd of March, over 1,000 tech leaders and researchers signed an open letter signaling their concerns about the potential for harm in a future scenario in which artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence, or a strong AI becomes a reality and calling for a moratorium on the development of very large models. The release of uh, uh, 
large language models like ChatGPT in November 2022, and the debate and controversy around these and other generative AI tools have further highlighted the importance of urgency to think about governance, to think about institutions, to think about rules, to think about competencies and capacities of users and governance. And this is something that UNESCO has been doing for several years now. These models are powerful, but suffer from many of the same problems as previous AI systems in terms of transparency, in terms of reliability, in terms of uh, credits, the sources of where it comes. And therefore, we need to be really focusing on how to make sure that these systems deliver for good their amazing power, but how much we also can control the downsides in terms of uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, predictability or fairness or, or robustness of the systems. And we are proud to share with you, as we have uh, commented in previous editions of RAID, that we continue to implement the, the very global instrument that uh, UNESCO has delivered through the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence that was adopted in 2021, signed by 193 members. We are, we are laying there the values and principles, as well as concrete policy actions for member states, including the commitment to develop regulatory frameworks, governance frameworks, to ensure some responsible and ethical AI ecosystems. Because AI pervades everything, every ministry has its own area to address, every uh, uh, private sector, public sector, universities, therefore we need to find a way in which all the voices can bring their knowledge to build a more solid uh, system. UNESCO is now working hand in hand with governments to help implement the recommendation. We are working now with 40 countries. Uh, we are advancing the debate. Now I am uh, uh, in, in Senegal because we are launching our next Tuesday the implementation of the recommendation. And we are doing it with two tools that we developed that last year. The first one is the readiness assessment methodology, which is a diagnostic tool aimed to help countries understand how prepared they are to implement AI ethically and responsible for all its citizens. It is intended to highlight institutional and regulatory gaps to enable UNESCO to tailor support for governments to fill those gaps and ensure uh, an ethical ecosystem. It's about the capacities of governments, because here the question is not this false debate between regulating or not regulating, but how to do it effectively and how to have the institutions well prepared to do so, allowing for innovation to continue to happen and of course in close cooperation with the private sector. The second tool is the ethical impact assessment, which aims to help government officials involved in procurement AI system to ensure that they are aligned uh, with these values and principles and that we know what we're buying, that we are uh, safe, that we are secure, that, uh, that they are solid, that they are robust. And therefore, this uh, tool will help uh, those uh, sectors in the governments that are deploying AI for their own purposes. But it's not only for the, for the public sector, we also want to work with the private sector with this ethical impact assessment, because we always call for ethics to go ex ante before deploying the tools, the developments in the markets, they need to be tested ethically. This ex ante test is what we're trying to advance with the tool uh, on the ethical impact assessment. And we're very pleased because we have uh, also worked with a, a large group of, of uh, uh, very important actors in the ecosystem. Microsoft and Telefonica are sharing uh, the Council of Enterprises that are helping us to advance this goal. And, and these tools are also something that they are uh, taking a look at. Since adopting the recommendations, governments and uh, uh, companies have begun to bring AI systems into line to comply with the principles as a prelude to legislation. UNESCO will monitor the progress of the legislations and countries will be obliged to report on their progress every four years. But this is work in construction. We are discussing with them because we need to get it right. There is not a single system that will tell us how to regulate AI in an effective manner because it depends also on the countries and their societal preferences. But we need to bring all the expertise to get it right and to ensure that we are uh, deploying this uh, technology in a safe mode. Now we are also building an AI ethics experts without borders. 
This is a network that will be supporting member states in developing in-house expertise among policymakers for crafting policies and interventions in line with the recommendation. I'm, I'm also glad to tell you that last week we launched the Women for Ethical AI with Alessandra Sala from Schiller Stock, but we have 15 members of this fantastic network to help us advance the chapter on gender equality that is unique also because we include from the several chapters that the recommendation has, one policy chapter is about gender and, and we're going to rely on this fantastic network of women to advance gender equality because as you know, having only 20% of women in the sector uh, is not really uh, going to help us address uh, gender biases and gender uh, gaps. And, and we are going to be advancing with them, not only the gender chapter, but also the, the, the deployment of the ethical elements of the, of the recommendation because they are experts on many other fields. We are also developing the AI Ethics Observatory. This is a, an online platform and I invite you all to contribute. We are putting there the case studies, the knowledge, the, uh, we are linking with networks of institutions all over the world that are developing awareness and understanding of, of the ethics of AI. We will release, uh, when, when we release uh, increasingly powerful AI models, as, as we have seen recently, we need to be sure that we are prepared. We need to be sure that the groundwork has been done to, to ensure that these uh, amazing technological developments deliver for good, deliver for enhancing our human rights, enhancing human dignity, helping us to deliver on climate uh, transitions, and also delivering for a more fair and inclusive world. I know that you will be discussing these issues in RAID conference. It's a, it's a powerful venue to do those things and I wish you the best in these discussions.